recording? Wait, what? Are we recording? Yes. You did that thing again where you didn't tell me. Well, you know, I want to start as au naturel as possible. It's our first time seeing each other since last year. Can you believe it? I never said happy new year to you. Happy new year. Happy new year. Guess what? What? This is episode 49, which is my lucky number. (gasps) Which means next week will be 50. Yes. Halfway to a century. Wow. Remember that time when I said, oh, in 100 episodes, it'll be a year. And you were like, that's not how weeks work. (laughs) (laughs) How was your Christmas? You know, it was fabulous in that I got sick and slept on the couch most of the time. How was yours? Uh, It was about the same in that I also got sick. And at the same time, Allison met my family. Uh, I heard it went well, though. It went well. My mom's pretty much gung-ho about this. Listen, if Linda supports it, I support it. My as soon as they met and Allison went upstairs to grab something, my mom dragged me into the bathroom and was like, I really like her. I uh, really, really like her. I and mean, I was like, you come could on. just say it to her face. Well, and Linda's not going to lie to you. So no, I've never seen her more sincere. <laughs> it was fantastic. very weird. I didn't approve until now. And now I approve. Oh, good. So well, also because I got sick, Allison had a lot of opportunities to stay upstairs and take care of me. But she took care of me and hung out with my family by herself. Oh, I wouldn't have done that. I know. That's what (laughs) impressed everyone. They were like, you don't have to be here. Like, you don't have to be this nice. And she hung out with them on her own and took care of me at the same time. So my mom is very excited for us to never break up. I'm so happy. Blaze came to my house and my parents were like, he's a good boy, as usual. (laughs) It's like, oh, yeah, you should marry him. Yeah, they're like, well, okay, I guess we'll support your wedding and... I'm tr- I'm going back in March to do food tasting and wedding dress shopping, which is terrifying to me because it just seems like a lot. When I came, when I went home, my mom was trying to get me to do some wedding projects with ah. her, and she showed me where she's getting married. Where is she getting married? Um, it's downtown in our. I mean, we only have one. Area. But can you triangulate it though? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> well, only because I don't remember the name of it. Oh. <laughs> but um, otherwise, you would absolutely otherwise I would. reveal publicly. Can you imagine so many people would just show up in Fredericksburg that one weekend? <laughs> but I, mean, uh, I would because I'm not invited, but I'd crash it anyway. Very surprised you're not invited. Listen, I'm still upset about it. She's weaning out people very fast. She's uh, apparently they're trying to not break the budget. Linda, consider yourself weaned. <laughs> so she uh, showed me where they're getting married, and it's a very weird area where they're quote walking down the aisle because it's a random piece of grass what in between like the roundabout where the cars come (laughs) wait what and like a cliff it's literally called suicide hill i'm sorry oh that's how we can triangulate it i know it by suicide hill what the hell it's literally it's just like a steep fall off where like i mean like if you fell like you would hurt you get hurt but you like you wouldn't even really get hurt (laughs) enough like i would for ten dollars fall down it like it's not that bad like, it's just called Suicide Hill because it looks like you could really get hurt, but also you really wouldn't. It's like a four-foot drop. What in the actual hell? So she's, it's not even meant to be an aisle or anything. It's just a weird patch did, of lawn. How, how did she find it? Well, the whole venue is really pretty. Oh, it's a venue. Like, it's actually. Like, there's a venue indoors, but she wants to get married outside, so it's in, like, this weird side yard. <laughs> it's driveway. very <laughs> odd. It's very odd. And she was trying to, like kind of dance around the fact that it was weird she was trying to throw a lot of ideas at me she's like or we could do it here and i'm like mom this is weird (laughs) this is a weird thing and you know it (laughs) so anyway well as long as she's happy i'm happy for her also it's going to be june virginia and it's i think a night wedding so human no it's just going to rain the whole time oh (laughs) so good anyway we'll Well, see how it goes i give you our save the date that you we did. Finally, got mailed. You were the third person to receive a save the date. You gave me Allison's save the date I, I and gave said, you. "Here's your save the date." <laughs> well, and Allison was like, "I expect mine to be mailed," and I was like, "Fine." So well, you'll be getting one in the mail. Well, you did get a Christmas gift. I did slash an engagement gift. What do you mean? This was supposed to get to you back when you got engaged. What in July? But it took a long time to get here. What is it? Wait, you have it right now? I have it. Why do you always do this to me? Well, this is not my gift. This I'm the messenger currently. Whose gift is it? This is comes from Deirdre. Oh, Deirdre! After you guys met and be, quickly became fast friends. It's not a cross stitch. It's not a cross oh. stitch. As soon as they... Do you want to talk about how you guys came to be? How you guys got to know each other <laughs> real quick? Just like a synopsis. I mean, Deirdre showed up and was like, hey, I'm going to be on the podcast. 
Mm-hmm. And we were like, yeah, we know. And then <laughs> she came on the podcast and was like, by the way, I made this fucking amazing cross stitch that features everybody of the podcast that looks like it costs $200 on Etsy. <laughs> and then was like, okay, bye. And then, well, then all of a sudden we were all, all on the couch after we recorded. Right. And we just started talking about weird shows. Mm-hmm. We started talking about My Strange Addiction. <laughs> Yeah, we did. And what did you guys bond over specifically? It was a squirrel. <laughs> what was its name again? Sugarbush. Sugarbush. I was gonna say sassy, but that's your class. Describe Sugarbush to the to the Listen, to okay. the listeners. Here's the thing. There's a squirrel. Okay, there's this lady. She's crazy. And she has okay, there's this really bananas fucking nut job lady. And she is on my strange addiction. And I fully support her, but she's pretty fucking bonkers. <laughs> And she <laughs> decided that her squirrel is like her like pageant child. Like she's like a dance mom or like a pageant mom, but like for her squirrel, <laughs> like a literal wild squirrel. And somehow she like, um, um, what's the thing where you're you... very, uh, anxiety <laughs> written all of a sudden. Can you breathe? No. <laughs> <laughs> what's the thing where you, um, where you are kidnapped and then you like, Oh, when you're sedated, like the squirrel is? No. Abducted. No, when you're kidnapped, but then you Held like... hostage. You like um, associate with your abductor. Oh, uh, Stockholm Syndrome? Yeah, so basically her husband has Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, it's... We love our pet squirrel. They literally decided not to have children so that they could give their full attention to the squirrel. They said they didn't want to take attention away from Sugarbush. The ne- the squirrel's name is Sugarbush, in case you haven't noticed. And also, they fucking put clothes on it, and she has 350 outfits for this fucking squirrel. And if you go online, because Sugarbush has their own website, <laughs> and you can see the entire gallery of every picture... <laughs> That this international supermodel of a squirrel has taken, I mean, by the way. And then you can you can literally, like, buy them and frame them for yourself, these pictures. I'm going to lose my fucking mind, and I don't know what you're about to give me, but I can't breathe about it. Well, this was supposed to be your engagement present from oh Deirdre. God. I'm going to lose my fucking However, mind. However, because it's come so late, it's an engagement slash Christmas. But the theme was engagement. Okay. <laughs> so this was entitled... I'm lose this my one's mind. entitled June Bride. <laughs> I want you to notice at the bottom corner, Sugarbush has autographed <laughs> it. Oh my god. Why did I do this to this poor squirrel? <laughs> it's a- oh my god. They really dunked his feet in ink and he really autographed That's it. That's literally his autograph? Yes. I'm gonna cry. Deirdre, thank you. I'm gonna post a photo of this on our on our Instagram. You guys, if you haven't seen the episode, <laughs> please watch the episode. This is how my childhood best friend and my L.A. best friend <laughs> became best friends, where one of them was like, have you heard of Sugarbush? And the other was like, teach me everything. <laughs> and then they didn't need me in the room for the rest of that night. They just bonded very weirdly together. I'm going to get this framed. Blaze is going to be like, why is this hanging above our marital bed? Because <laughs> it's a June bride. It's wearing a wedding dress. I do want to show you one. I can't even breathe right now. Okay. I also got one. Wait, shut up. As my Christmas gift. Please show me. Mine is also autographed. Oh my God. Mine is titled Finding Osama. Ah, what? Oh. <laughs> this poor squirrel. <laughs> Wait, fuck. Somebody needs to get these people a therapist immediately. I, 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 it's a squirrel riding a tank with, with a little a fucking turban on. <laughs> yep. It says Sugar Bush Squirrel goes undercover in Afghanistan to search for the evil Osama bin Laden. Sugar Bush is stuck between a rock and a hard place. You can tell that this is a very Republican squirrel owner. Clearly. Yep. Anyway, we both got very interesting gifts. You've got to frame that from too. the same squirrel. Oh yeah, we will do side by side. I'm hanging this in our podcast room. Anyway, so I thought we would start on a high note. That just overwhelmed me so much. <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting that. I thought you were gonna be like, "Oh, here's a gift. It's wine," and I was gonna like <laughs> freak out. But this was like a different level. There you go. Probably the best gift you've gotten on this podcast. It's the best gift I've gotten 
in any universe of any lifetime. Including your engagement ring. All of it. All right. So first of all, this episode, number 49, my lucky number, is donated to, is donated, is dedicated. <laughs> You're it welcome. It is donated. I'm going to get. On our behalf. A tax credit for it. <laughs> this is uh, dedicated to Mio Diaz. Ooh. So thank you for your $25 donation, your $25 pledge, like we're PBS or something. Yeah, right. Yeah. Your phone pledge. <laughs> thank you, Mio. Mio's been a dedicated donor um, since September. That's like four months. That's a long, long time. Holy smokes. Mio deserves this. Mio. What is, doesn't Mio mean? It means my. My? Okay. Like Dios Mio. Like my God. Oh. All right. Uh, a lot of people have been like, hey, um, I donated a month or two ago and where's my merch? And let's just say I'm trying real hard. <laughs> oh, what happened? No, it's just like a lot. And I didn't ever prepare for this many people to be supporting us. So I'm trying to get everyone's merch out, but it's hundreds of people. So it's kind of coming in waves. It's overwhelmingly wonderful. It's and wonderfully overwhelming. Thank you. That's the best way to put it. And I will say that um, I did send a message out to everyone on Patreon. If you have not received your merch and you are a $10 or more donor, please send me, please respond to the message and send me your address and what level donation you are because everything is going to go out this month. It's coming. I promise. We're, we put out a few blooper reels gonna be doing some video soon i know i keep saying that but we actually remember that time we were like we're all caught up yeah and then everyone was like no you're not (laughs) (laughs) and i was like we were yesterday and now we're not anymore anyway so i just i i promise it's coming i promise okay i believe you overwhelmed (laughs) it's okay we believe you but i love you guys so much i just never thought this many people would support us we were just talking about this our anniversary is coming up next month Two weeks from now, I thought. Oh, no, two weeks. Two weeks from now is the anniversary of me asking if you wanted to do a podcast with so me. So, like, the proposal. The proposal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Our weeks. engagement. Two weeks from today, yeah. And wow. then February 9th is our anniversary. That's bananas. We really did not think we would even last a year. Em brought this up, and we started laughing, and then it became one of those laughs where you just, like, can't stop fucking laughing. It was laughing. just building. It was like a chuckle, and then the chuckle turned into a, a hearty <laughs> laugh, and then the hearty laugh turned into a wallop. It was just like a... <laughs> <laughs> a wallop a yes. walloping laugh we were i was like crying i was laughing so hard because we were like this is insane I, we cannot believe that we can't believe it anyone has listened to us for a year <laughs> why what i can't you, believe what you, are you guys doing do you have other hobbies go get them <laughs> listen go play golf go anything go call your dad and play golf oh no or mom moms can play too listen gentlemen only ladies forbidden i think not there's a ladies tea for a reason oh you know what I think is very sexist? Tell me. Okay. Uh, there is a, a glasses company who will go unnamed. <gasps> Warby um, Parker. No, I'm really not going to name them. Lens Crafters. I'm still not going to name them. Uh, but it's a sunglasses. They're like a tactical company. Ray so Ban. they're... Stop it. So they're known to be like very like masculine. Uh-huh. But they only have two options on their... Um, like for all of their glasses, they only have two options. One is adult, and the other is female. <laughs> and I only found this out because they're one of the brands that we represent at my job. And so I was looking at the website to look at their styles, <laughs> and they all come in either adult or female. And I was like, I guess you can't be both. Weird. I'm, listen, <laughs> I'm not doing this. Listen, I... That's irritating. It's like those Bic pens that were like... For women. Children, adults, and then women's pens and they were like all pink and you were like wait what yeah, they're all pink and apparently they're like meant to be held a certain way oh yeah or a woman's touch it was like finally pens for women it's, it's like, like oh what i've been looking for this whole time <laughs> wow my secretary job was not fit for me <laughs> until now anyway um beep boop bop that's all i have to say okay well i have to say this so this isn't a ghost story i'm my resolution for the show is to bring more variety oh fuck yes i'm so excited So a lot of people have asked about this. We've gotten emails from Jason, Deacon, and Beverly. What? What a... That sounds like... What an assortment of names. Sounds like the cast of, like, Stranger Things 3. (laughs) (laughs) All three of them have asked for this story, although it is not 
Wait. Ghostly. Tell me what it is. It is supernatural. It is uh, my first alien story. <gasps> oh my God, I'm so excited. And it's the, as far as I know, I'm not very um, privy to the UFO world just yet. You're not? But from what I've been told from Google is that this is like the landmark UFO case. Okay. It's like the main one. I want to just tell you real quick that aliens are one of the things that scare me the most yay you'll have a good time then so i just want to warn you i'm gonna be really fucking freaked out like i'm not usually with ghost stories so you're gonna be gasping a lot you say i'm gonna be looking out the windows like a where's your wine where's your weight watchers wine here's the thing allison was like i'll bring wine and then brought one bottle well she doesn't know how to party clearly she didn't live up to my expectations yeah and then she said oh i got you ice cream and then like ate half of it i was like that's not there was a whole gallon of ice cream, M. That's That doesn't mean anything to me. All right, go on. This is the story of Barney and Betty Hill. Oh, my. They are humans, not aliens. <laughs> the Martians. Well, Barney I feel like and Betty. I ought to say something. Because, well, Barney and Betty, aren't they Flintstones? Barney is a dinosaur. No, Barney Rubble and Betty Rubble. No. They're the Flintstones' friends. I thought her name... Oh, the one Fred Flintstone. And his friend is Barney Rubble, and then he marries Betty. So Wendy... Hmm. Wait. Wendy? Wilma? That Wilma, that's her name. Wilma and Fred Flintstone had pebbles, and then his best friend, Barney Rubble, is with Betty, and they have Bam Bam. So this is a cartoon. So really, Barney and Betty either were abducted and then cavemen... Oh my. Or were cavemen and then abducted. That seems more likely in my brain. Okay. Sure. This is just like the like the sequel to Flintstones. So it's like when they meet the Jetsons. Yes. Okay. Except they're meeting. Oh, well, they are from outer space. Yeah. That's are the Jetsons from outer space or just the future? Uh, the, I mean, both. Okay. Barney and Betty Hill. Um, they were the first family, well, couple. They're the first people to introduce the gray alien into popular culture. So like the <gasps> idea... That we all have when we think of an alien, like, super short yeah. with a big head and, like, black cat-like eyes with no noses and they're bald. And they're creepy, like... And, like, very, like, thin digits. Gangly. Yes. Mm -hmm. That image, apparently, that stereotypical image of an alien was introduced in this story. Okay. And this is also the story that began the entire alien abduction phenomenon. What? So. Phenomenon. Phenomenon. Sure. So, uh... This is in 1961 mm -hmm. in New Hampshire at 10.30 p.m. That's very specific. And uh, the hills, more like the rubbles. <laughs> am I right or am I right? Am I right or am I not <laughs> wrong? Uh, they were coming home from vacation. Uh, they were on their way back to Portsmouth, New Hampshire from their trip to my homeland, Canada. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say Virginia, but you went. No, I went to the truth. The I went real to, homeland. I went to the reality. Gotcha. Barney, we're going to step aside from the fact that they're obviously cavemen. Mm. Barney was a uh, black postman. Oh. Betty was a white social worker. And oh. they were in an interracial couple. And this was the 1960s. I was going to say, that's pr quite progressive. So that's just like a fun fact, but also might be important later. Totally. So Betty, it all starts, they're driving from my homeland mm -hmm. and betty sees a bright light in the sky that moved from below the moon like it started up below the moon and started flying vertical okay up and down in front of the moon ew and the light was growing bigger and brighter and moved rapidly she assumed immediately it was a ufo but um barney thought it was a plane okay so originally he was like oh, it's probably a plane but then all of a sudden it started moving pretty wildly so and it's he was like, like me and blaze where i'm like it's a ufo yes and he was like it's a plane and blaze is literally always like it's a helicopter or plane and it's always a helicopter or plane yeah <laughs> but this time maybe barney was wrong except okay. this time team christine won finally i've been waiting so the light grew bigger and brighter started moving pretty erratically mm -hmm. um they stopped the car uh and betty saw quote an odd shaped craft with flashing multicolored lights moving in front of the moon oh no um it then quickly went from being far away to dropping down almost on top of the car. Oh, no. Um, it dropped down. It was getting closer and closer to them. And for some reason, instead of freaking out, they just drove slowly. 
So they were doing the blaze thing to be like, well, let's observe and see what's going on. Like, just don't look too closely. I'm sure it's just an airplane. Yeah. So they were driving really slow to observe it Uh um, as it got closer and closer to them. Betty swears that the whole experience, as huge and loud and bright as it was, it was eerily silent. Oh, man. Um, That's so creepy. And it was over 100 feet long and rotated above them in a circle. Oh, my God. That's awful. And they were driving slowly. Like, get the fuck out of there. Eventually, it hovered about 100 feet above their car. And it was so big that if you look through the the windshield it filled the entire view oh my god you couldn't even see in front of you because it was just taking over so much space Uh uh-uh. um fun fact it reminded barney of a huge pancake and it reminded betty of a banana <laughs> <laughs> so, whenever food gets involved okay. i have to bring it up but i'm guessing so, like it just means like long wide and flat so it's like that jack johnson song or what's the name banana phone is that what you're talking about? No, I'm not talking about fucking banana phone. What's his name? Jack John Jack Johnson? Who sings like, I'll make you banana pancakes? Yeah. Oh, okay. Is that Jack Johnson? I think so. Yeah. But yes, you're, banana pancakes. Listen, banana phone, whatever. The bananagrams, what are they called? Bananas and pajamas. That's what I'm thinking I about. love the bananas and pajamas. You know what? It, it always, it probably actually scarred me a little when I was younger that I couldn't figure out how to say it the right way because... Pajamas, bananas, and pajamas. Because pajamas and pajamas are used interchangeably, but usually I would think like, oh, bananas and pajamas, because at least I can guarantee that bananas is how you're supposed to say it. Mm. But then in other countries, it's bananas. Well, and they were British, so they were like bananas and pajamas. Yeah, and they said pajama, and I was like, oh fuck! I was like, wait, which one is it? I now I can't tell. I'll tell you what, we hmm. had really traumatic, rough childhoods. That's what, that's what I make of yeah, this whole experience. Your, uh, your mom ha- was held at gunpoint during Christmas one time, and I can't pronounce bananas. <laughs> so, I mean, we're both living, like, you know, similar lives, I think. Uh, I'm more scarred about the bananas and pajamas, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's fine. So, anyway, they're thinking it's a pancake or a banana, apparently. Then using binoculars, because I guess in the 60s, everyone just had those. Or, you know what? They were on vacation. I'll give them some slack. They just bring, but do you, what? Okay. They had binoculars. So using binoculars, um, Barney claimed, because first of all, I would not think, let me grab the binoculars (laughs) when there is a flying saucer so big I can't see outside my car and it's hovering on top of me. Yeah, the last thing I want is to see it closer. Yeah, I wouldn't be like, oh, get the get the binoculars. I can't see anything else, but this is still too far away. Right. Um, But anyway, that's what Barney did. Sure thing. He used the binoculars and claimed that he saw about 8 to 11 humanoid figures Oh, no. staring at them from a window in the craft. Oh, no. All but one left the room that they were... Like in the the room with the oh, window that they were looking out of. And the one that stayed continued to stare at Barney and telepathically told him, stay where you are and keep looking. Barney said that they wore glossy black uniforms and black caps. Oh, my. Which is creepy. I've never seen a glossy uniform. I don't know what that means. Like pleather? Pleather. I was about to say maybe they were strippers. Oh, that puts a spin on things listen this is actually a big porno from the 70s or what year was this the all of a sudden you'll hear <laughs> did someone order a pizza on this ufo <laughs> a banana and pajamas perhaps oh no <laughs> a banana pizza <laughs> oh kill me oh my so uh, a long ramp then descended from the bottom of the craft no as it does sure and Barney ran back to his car. Because, by the way, he's also gotten wait, out wait, at this wait, point. Wait, wait. He got out of the car with the binoculars to do some real fucking it's like viewing. Like bird watching. And he ran back to the car because now he's scared. Now that a ramp shows up. <clears throat> not fucking 11 humanoids in glossy pleather. Talking to you telepathically. Right. Mm-hmm. But the ramp coming down from the craft is what scared him. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he ran down and he got back to his car and drove at high speed and told Betty to keep lookout for the object. Poor Betty. Betty's like, I don't want anything to do with this. <laughs> Betty. Betty's like, get me out. <laughs> uh, they, As they're looking for it, the um, craft starts going away and coming back, like fading in and out of visibility. Oh, my. Like it's almost putting a cloak on itself. Yeah. And then coming back and then trying to hide itself again. Then they hear a rhythmic series of beeping and buzzing. Okay. That uh, I guess it's very melodic. Like they can, it right. makes a certain sound to them. And 
it apparently was like vi- making the whole car vibrate. Um, the car vibrating was so strong that they also began to feel tingling in their own bodies. Oh. And they experienced the beginning of an altered state of consciousness that left them zombie-like. Oh. Where they couldn't do anything. They were just in a trance. Were they still driving? Mm-hmm. Oh, my. That's dangerous. So they are now basically, I guess that was like, if this is a real story, and if this really happened, it is. then that's how they get you to do whatever you want. That's how they put you in a trance-like state. Okay. You, they just tingle you up. <laughs> oh, is that what it's called? <laughs> yep. Oh, okay. They tingle you. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Got it's it. the pleather, honestly. It's, <laughs> it's the pleather. The pleather will just tingle you all the way to your core. <laughs> and so, uh, the next thing they remember is a second series of beeping or buzzing sounds to the same m- melody, rhythm, yeah. same rhythm. Um, and they return to full consciousness. They had traveled nearly 35 miles and several hours had passed. Whoa. Wait, so they were driving like one mile an hour? They were driving like half a mile an hour. <laughs> oh my God. They were, like, I imagine if they like, if something was keeping the car at bay, maybe it was like just kind of keeping it on like a slow roll or something. Can you imagine like pulling up and being like, God damn it. Like honking and like pulling yeah. past and oh they're both my. zombies. Can you, oh, can you imagine so that? Fucking or creepy. imagine looking in the car and no one's in there. And it's just rolling. It's just rolling very slowly. I think I'd be more creeped out if they were like zombie like. I don't know. It's just creepier. I think it'd be creepier if there was a car with no no one in it. Just driving. So I'd be like, how is it perfectly staying on the road? I mean, that's fair. So when they got home, because they were just like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> Some shit that you and I would do, I guess. Oh, standard. When they got home, they had some very weird behavior that they could not explain. Oh, no. Betty insisted that they put the luggage at the back door instead of the main part of the house or taking it apart or unloading it or anything like that. What? Which is like, we have to keep it at the back door. Um, both of their watches were broken. Of course. The binocular strap was torn, and they didn't know why. Oh, my God. Um, the tips of Barney's best dress shoes were scraped up. Oh, and God forbid. Uh, he obsessively began examining his genitals in the bathroom <gasps> and couldn't explain why, but oh, he needed no. to check his genitals. Oh no. They both took very long showers and don't remember why, but know that they needed to remove contamination. No, but they don't know why they were both so compulsively Ugh. desperate to do it. It's horrifying. The next morning, because then they go to bed, they're like, oh, that was weird. So <laughs> just, then, honey, just leave the luggage by the back door. Just, and check your genitals. And uh, so the <laughs> next... <laughs> check your genitals. Just, sorry, sure. sorry your shoes are scuffed. Check your genitals. Okay. That should just be what we tell people now. It's like, look, it's not our fault. <laughs> check your genitals. Really, that is a good PSA, though. I mean... You don't know what you did at the club last night? Check your genitals. I mean, it can't hurt. Yeah. It's really, we're just protecting society. We're just trying to help. We're just trying to help everybody. Um, the next morning... Uh, Betty placed her shoes and her clothing that she had worn into the closet, but she noticed that they were torn and covered in weird pink powder. Ew. And by torn, like her clothing, like her, she was wearing a dress and the hem, like zipper and everything was was just completely torn apart. Oh my God. Fun fact about that dress. Years later, crop circle investigators... Let me just say that again, because I think I almost said transvestites, and I it was a very weird experience. <laughs> I saw investigators, but I read it in my mind as transvest, and then transvestigators, and then alligators. So I was like transvestite and alligators. It was a. I think I just. I think I just got abducted. I'm really pleased that you're trying to explain it, but it really isn't. It like isn't helping. No, it's not explaining anything. Anyway, crop circle transvestite alligators. Sure, sure. Um. Years later, crop circle investigators uh-huh. examined the dress and they said that it had, quote, an, an anomaly for bi- a biological substance in a non... God damn it. I, it, I, this whole sentence is wrong. Is that what they said? That's <laughs> really... <laughs> Can you imagine if a doctor came in and was like, I'm sorry, my whole sentence was uh, wrong. Just hold on. Although, not that a crop cir- circle investigator is really the equivalent of a doctor <laughs> in my mind, but... It's fine. <laughs> Had an anomalous biological substance. Oh, what does that mean? It means they don't know what they it was, but it was it just is. some weird toxic substance. So what is a parent? What is a, a, a... Keep in mind, when I say years later, I mean like 40 years later. 
So really this anomaly could have just been like mites and mold and dust over time, but they can't explain why it's pink or why it's been there for 40 years and hasn't blown itself off the dress. Okay. Um, Creepy. But interesting that it was torn to pieces and in a weird, had a weird pink powder. All over. It is really upsetting that the zipper was torn off and stuff. Yuck. Um, over the years, uh, five different laboratories have also conducted chemical and forensic analysis on the dress. Really? A lot of people have been very interested in this dress. And not like the pleather shit that the aliens are wearing. <laughs> I'm more interested in that personally. Also, when they woke up that morning, there were shiny circles scraped into the bare metal on the car's trunk. Ew. So like the parts that used to have a color like paint, now there were just perfect metal circles Ew. scraped into the car. What the fuck? That had not been there the previous day. They put um, a compass near the spots and the needle would go crazy next to those <laughs> spots because for some reason those were magnetized, but the rest of the car was not. So they called a friend of theirs in the Air Force to report a UFO sighting. Okay. And originally he said, oh, no, you just, you just misidentified Jupiter. It's like, sometimes Jupiter likes to take your clothes off. It's a little aggressive. Sometimes he's like, I mean, honestly, Jupiter needs to calm down. Jupiter's a little sexually frustrated and... <laughs> Also wants you to keep your luggage by the back door. I don't know. Right. Also check your genitals. Yeah, please. Always. Um, so basically he ended up filing the report in Project Blue Book. Do you know what that is? No. So Project Blue Book was one of, I think it was the third one back in like the 50s. It was one of the government's first records of any oh. UFO sightings. They were trying to figure out how to define ufos and then if any of them were causing threats to national security right basically. okay so there was like over 12,000 i think it was from 52 to like 69 mm -hmm. over 12,000 reports holy shit were put in project blue book like to the government level yeah. oh my god but they did like and of course this does not mean it's true because the government's just saying whatever they fucking want to us but if you look it up, it says that all of them have been debunked, de either debunked or they were not a threat to national security. They were just misidentified flying objects. Guess what? Bullshit. Oh, a thousand percent. Oh, my God. If I get abducted, I swear to God. Oh, yeah. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> what? I didn't do it. I'm mad at you already if I get abducted. So the friend in the Air Force later found out like 20 years later, that the UFO that they saw was actually also confirmed that night at two different Air Force <gasps> facilities, both within hours of the abduction. Shut up. And, however, due to the altitude and low speed of this flying object, they were officially filed as weather balloons. No, the fucking weather balloons. It's, it's such a government thing to just such call something bullshit. a weather balloon. So, also fun fact, 10 days after the abduction... Betty started having persistent nightmares for oh. five nights in a row. Oh, no, 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 no. Freaked out and wanting to remember them, she began writing down everything she could remember, which was quite detailed. Oh, fuck. And one dream, just one of them, her and Barney were at a roadblock and men surrounded their car. They forced her to walk into the forest and she saw Barney walking behind her in the forest. So she screamed for him, but he was in a trance and wasn't responding to her. The men were five feet, wore matching black uniforms mm -mm. and military caps they had black hair, dark eyes, very prominent noses, blue lips, and gray skin. Barney and her uh, were walked up the ramp into a metal disc-shaped craft and separated from each other, where the leader said that if they were examined together, it would take longer. So they got separated. Oh, my God. The examiner, as Betty remembers, had a pleasant, calm manner and did not speak English as well as the leader. They said that they wanted to know the differences between humans and themselves, and they never gave a name for what they were. They took samples of hair, skin, and nails and examined their eyes, ears, mouth, teeth, throat, hands, legs, and feet. They stabbed a needle into her belly button. <gasps> Don't do that. Don't do that. However, whenever she showed signs of pain, the leader would just wave his hand in front of her and the pain would vanish. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, can you imagine? That'd be Imagine your Crohn's. You can just go, hello. It's like, oh, it's, listen, it's fine. Not a big deal. After the exam, she picked up a book with a bunch of symbols on it, and the leader said she could keep it. Oh. She asked where he came from, and he showed her a map with a bunch of dotted stars with lines connected to several of them. They began bringing uh, Betty and Barney 
back to the car when a Brett went a little bit when a fight broke out between these alien figures. Whoa. And then they told Betty she could no longer keep the book because they don't want her remembering having met them. Having what? Having met them. Oh, they said having a thumb. I was like, they took her thumb? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, sorry. <laughs> okay, it's not true crime yet. So Disembodied thumbs. So in 1964, they were referred to a psychiatrist. But keep in mind, this was also like two or three years later. Jesus. Um, the psychiatrist's name was Dr. Simon, and he recommended that they undergo regression therapy. Mm-hmm. So he hypnotized them. He hypnotized them separately and recorded all of their sessions. And Barney's recall of coming across these aliens or figures was super emotional and staff had to hold him down during these (gasps) sessions because he was having such emotional distress. Under hypnosis, he reported um, that he was so afraid the whole time that he kept his eyes closed for much of the abduction and the exam. So he does not have as many details as Betty does. Wow. Um, he said that the monocular strap, this is while he was under hypnosis. So he doesn't actually know this when yeah. he's conscious. Um, he said that the binocular strap broke when he ran from the UFO back to the car, which is interesting because when he's not being hypnotized, he doesn't know why the binocular Holy strap tore. Holy shit. Um, he recalled driving the car away from the UFO, but then felt irresistibly compelled to pull over and drive into the woods. What? He, and keep in mind, in case anyone's lost, this is supposedly what happened in between the first and second uh, tingling vibrations where they lost, like, chunks of time. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So he, because the last thing they remember is trying to get away from this thing that was flying over them. Right, and then hours passed. Yeah, and then hours passed. And then all of a sudden they came to the second time they felt the vibrating on the car. Right, right, right. So apparently he was driving away. He felt compelled to pull over. Mm -hmm. They ended up in the woods and he found six men on the road. The car stalled and three of the six men approached the car and told him to not be scared and close his eyes. I'm really free. Easy, easy to do. (laughs) I know if I saw six (laughs) men in the middle of the night in a forest and they were like, don't be scared, close your eyes. I'd be like, okay. It says pleather suits. It's like, (laughs) they're disarming. Just, oh yeah, just irresistible. (laughs) Really sweep you off your feet. (laughs) So while hypnotized, Barney said, this is the creepy part, uh-huh. uh, He, even though he did close his eyes, it wasn't because he wanted to. It's because their eyes pushed his eyes shut. Ew. What? He said, I saw two eyes coming close to my face. What? I, no, literally, the eyes p- closed his... I thought this his, was like a... Not a, like they stared at him. A so, metaphor. No, no, no. I stay... He said... I saw two eyes coming close to my face, and I felt like the eyes were pressing against mine. Oh, alien eyes on your eyeballs. Oh, so slimy. Yuck. They were taken onto a disc-shaped craft. And as I'm saying this, this is different than my normal paranormal stories, because I'm telling two different accounts, so I'm trying to, like, play catch-up and see how similar they are. So as I'm saying this, also think of the things that were going on in Betty's dream. Right, 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 right. See if they pan out. Okay. So he says they were taken onto a disc-shaped metal craft where they were separated, and he was told to lie on a small rectangular exam table. And keep in mind, now they're separated, so whatever we heard from Betty's experience was in a different room. Right. He was told to lie on a small rectangular exam table. He kept his eyes closed for most of the exam, unlike Betty, who apparently just voyeured all of this. (laughs) She's a badass. A device was put over his genitals. Oh, my. Which would make sense why the next day he had to keep checking them. Yeah. He says he didn't orgasm, but a sperm sample was taken. Ooh! Which means they, like, pulled it out of him. Ew! Whoa! They took skin samples and examined his ears and mouth and were very interested in his dentures. In his dentures? That's kind of mean. Apparently, they don't know what insecurities are on this planet. I mean, really, it's pretty cruel to point that out. This is pretty cruel, too. A tube was inserted into his anus. No, thank you. And he felt... Through the tube, someone touching his spine. Um, <laughs> Counting his vertebrae. I need you to stop talking because I don't know if you know, but spines are the Spines one- are- I know. I'm the same way. Spines freak me the fuck out. I'm going to lose my fucking mind. Imagine someone feeling your spine- Stop it! <laughs> em, I'm not kidding. Stop. I'm going to lose my- fu- I can't- <laughs> Blaze got a mug that ha- from Lisa that has like kind of like a drawing of it, and I was like, put it in the trash. I don't want to look at it. <laughs> 
<laughs> my dad's a chiropractor. I'm aware. Believe me. That's why I don't talk about it. The few times they communicated uh, that the humanoid figures communicate with Barney. Uh-huh. Uh, he said that every time that they spoke, it was telepathic and their mouths never moved when speaking. Wow. He was escorted to the car and told to watch them leave before he drove away. Under hypnosis, Betty's account is very similar to her dreams about um, about pretty much the exam and all that. Mm-hmm. But her capture release is a little different. The UFO's technology is a little different. And the description of the aliens were a little bit different. Interesting. However, that could be because at, when you're dreaming, you're just throwing random... You're projecting stuff yeah. into... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... There is that reason why it might not be similar. Okay. Um, Although the regression differed from her dreams, so even though, like, essentially the possible potential truth was different from her dreams, both Barney and Betty's regressions um, were very consistent with each other. That is what's creepy. Both of their descriptions were ultimately the first alien image of short in gray with huge black cat-like eyes bald and smooth green slash gray wrinkly skin smooth and wrinkly hmm. and you know what i mean like smooth yeah, but wrinkled in some it's parts kind of like like ripply yep icky betty's regressions were also very distressing so she also um either they would have to restrain her or end sessions early oh no so she was uh advised by dr simon that she should sketch out this map that the yeah. leader said, oh, this is where we're from. Right. So, and this is important. Her her map had 15 stars on it, and 12 of those stars were connected by lines, and she said that they told her these were main trade routes. So these were very often traveled Whoa. stars. Okay. The other three were uh, apparently less visited, but they were, they formed a very distinct triangle. Okay. So, in 1966, she also wrote a book called The Interrupted Journey, which included the star map star map that she drew. Okay. Two years later, an amateur astronomer, also an elementary school teacher, her name was Marjorie Fish. What a badass. From Oak Harbor, Ohio. O-H-I-O. She read the book and saw the star map, and she was so intrigued by it that as an amateur astronomer trying to play around with it she got kind of obsessed and tried to determine which star system the ufo could have possibly oh, come from man. so it was like one of those like freaky fans who like just had to know so yeah. she took the star map and literally uh in her own living room made her living room a 3d model of the sketch what and walked around it like dot by dot star by star and tried to figure out where in the galaxy the place, this place was. Holy smokes. So she went about it by assuming that one of those 15 stars had to have been the Earth's sun. Right. Um, Interesting. And she made a 3D model by... Uh, basically, she assumed that they one of them at least had to be a sun-like star. And so she used threads and beads. And then she made them the exact distance based on... It's called like the glee star catalog and it's like the most accurate for like stellar distances and stuff oh. like that so she used the 1969 catalog to determine the distances from each other so even though she used the 1969 version of that book to figure out all the distances that book like okay so she wrote this book in 1966 okay with the star map keep in mind she's had the star map since 1961 when they were abducted right so, like, eight years later, this catalog comes out. hmm And it's, like, the most up-to-date thing. Right. So that means that this... That means Betty drew something eight years before astronomers even discovered it. Ew. And so it matched the book? And it matched. Oh, no, no, no. So after several years, um, Marjorie Fish, the girl who's trying to do this... Yeah. She determined that the map was actually from the viewpoint of a double star system called Zeta Reticuli. What? And she was able to determine it because of the distinct triangle that the lesser three stars made. Um, Holy shit. So she submitted her thoughts because she was like, this is just a theory. I'm an amateur astronomer. What do you think? Here are my thoughts. Dear, dear Abby. <laughs> dear Abby. <laughs> I have some thoughts about these stars. Well, so she submitted her thoughts to Astronomy Magazine. Okay. 
and it invited readers to send in their comments and debate it. That was the first time that this magazine's ever done it, because even they didn't know. They were like, everyone write in and <laughs> like tell us what else. you thought. Someone else tell us what's going on. So it became a huge thing. So for like a year, they were like carrying arguments for and against this wow. idea that maybe it was Zeta Reticuli. Um, and that include like famous astronomers, like Carl Sagan was Jesus. like involved, like everyone and like famous astronomers were like against each other's opinions like wow even so they, they were literally know. arguing over this woman's yeah theory she was like hmm, amateur i don't think so she's like neil degrasse tyson's tweeting about me <laughs> like it's fine it's whatever so when she did draw this map it was eight years before it was this oh my god you know whoa i know three hours just passed <laughs> we just traveled 35 miles she okay so she drew the map eight years before it had been discovered okay um so some speculate because this, this is where the backlash comes i gave you all the info but this is the reception from people listen we're a hard news here we don't oh, have yeah. opinions about anything we don't i just feel like based on some of you nasty itunes reviews you're saying that i don't give you both sides of the coin so here Did you they go say that a few have i don't read those reviews oh they make me cry well, you know what i listen to them and if they're still gonna bitch and moan Sorry about it. But they're not listening anymore, so, like, whatever. Oh, well, I can just be done with my story then. Okay, bye. No, no, no. <laughs> so some speculate that Barney's recollection of the UFO was probably inspired by Betty just talking his ear off about it for two years. So they think, like, oh, you probably didn't really see anything. You're, you've are you just heard it so many times that you think... It's in your, like, subconscious or whatever. Because, uh, basically, after this all happened she started writing about it for like two right. years she was having those dreams and stuff yeah and she wanted to remember every detail about it and she got weirdly obsessed with this right. i mean who wouldn't if right, this happened right, to you right. but she got weirdly obsessed where she wrote about the accounts every day right for like two years and obviously if you're married to the guy like he's gonna have to hear about it every day for two years <laughs> oh, so <poor> guy. <laughs> he obviously knew her side of it and so later when it went into like hypnosis he could have just been repeating right like regurgitating things that she had said right so that's one thought of like oh he didn't really mean any of it it's just like so ingrained in oh him my god it's like if you put blaze under hypnosis and he's like yep there's ghosts in the world <laughs> there's also aliens he also geo's the best and i only drink red wine men don't count yep. only geo <laughs> red wine's the only beverage <laughs> and so uh some also say that the abduction was just a hallucination brought on by stress for being an interracial couple in the 1960s what? I know. Way, I'm to, way to find a way in a ufo abduction story to throw race into let's the mix. talk about that for a fucking second let's not even let's go go away so betty discounted this being like fuck you guys yeah, my relationship well, yeah. is happy and it's never caused an issue and then some people are also saying that this was just a whole dream that they concocted because they were sleep deprived from traveling <laughs> for so long <laughs> Like, look, I've been I, sleep deprived. I've never been fucking abducted from it. I wish my dreams were that fucking interesting that I could write a book about them. Some also say that the story was influenced. This is kind of a fair argument in my mind. Mm -hmm. Some say that the story was influenced from the movie that came out only like a couple years earlier, Invaders from Mars. Oh. And an episode on a sci-fi show called The Outer Limits. Okay. So The Outer Limits was a sci-fi show that was, I guess, getting really big at the time. And they had an episode broadcasted only two weeks before their abduction mm. about alien abduction, where the very first description of a gray alien ever happened. And then two weeks later, they, quote, got abducted and their only describer uh, their only description of an alien happened to be the exact same one that just showed up for the first time ever on an episode that came out two weeks ago. So do they think they just like, they think they watched the episode and then like, like intentionally copied it or like, like subconsciously subconsciously did it. But then what? I don't know, but it, I mean, the stereotypical alien description didn't right. show up until they announced it until they start talking about it. Yeah. And then they were like, and then people got skeptical and were looking back at me like actually only two weeks before right. you were the people who created that description an episode something created of a that, show that right. you watch just happened two weeks beforehand so they watch the show they say no but other people are like i know them and they watch the show <laughs> so 
Listen, Betty's my neighbor. Yeah, I'm not going to say I peek through their window. I'm just going to say I know what they watch it's on TV. It's not like my lace curtains are transparent or anything, but I definitely <laughs> watch their TV. But yeah, so the first ever description of gray aliens came from them. Uh, and two weeks prior in an episode that they watched. That's a little sketch. Um, also, the original description that Betty had of the aliens in her nightmare is that they were short men with black hair and big noses. But in Barney's regression alone, he described a stereotypical gray alien. And after Betty heard his recorded session, all of a sudden she started describing the same Interesting. alien. Interesting. So they were like, mm, you weren't doing that before. And then she never mentioned the black hair and short noses again. Interesting. It was always gray hair or bald, no hair and no noses. No noses. Oy. You know how aliens don't really have noses? It's so creepy. So it was more than two years after the abduction that they finally got hypnotized so other people also think like oh well after two years of just sitting on it before actually getting any regression therapy done your story could have easily changed and probably thinking about it all the time and having dreams and stuff yeah yes and so um regardless of all that because they were the first people to really start this abduction phenomenon quote Mm -hmm. um they were invited to a lot of like alien conspiracy conventions and like all these wild events right surrounding ufos and they became pretty famous as a couple in that community but then they also started becoming kind of embarrassing because so many people were skeptical about Aww. their story and one enthusiast one ufo enthusiast actually worked with them at a ufo event and said that betty was so obsessed with ufos that it made him not even believe her own story what and that when they were just walking around, she was unable to distinguish a UFO from a streetlight. So, like, whoa, so she, she was, was totally not reliable. Bonkers. In 1995, she wrote a self published book called A Common Sense Approach to UFOs, because <laughs> obviously I need one of those. Listen, don't use a nonsensical approach. And even UFO enthusiasts were like, it's filled with delusional stories. <gasps> They're saying that she saw like a truck levitate above a freeway and it never got reported. Whoa. And in 1966, she also wrote, I now regularly see our, quote, friends about eight or nine times out of ten every time we get in a car. What? And it's like, okay, but if that's the case, why aren't you fucking reporting that shit? Like, to, like, so it's make yourself valid. There's a street light every time you get in a yeah, car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Woof. So, regardless of how true it is, most of Betty Hill's notes, tapes, and other items are on display permanently at the University of New Hampshire. Interesting. And in 2011, the spot on the road where their car was potentially abducted uh got a historical marker really Mm -hmm. cool as the first famous abduction site cool so there you go whoa i love alien stories but they scare the shit out of me i think the only thing that scared me out of all that is getting stabbed with a needle in the belly button the belly button and uh spine spine. no no don't talk about it please (laughs) okay i'm gonna have nightmares and then i'm gonna get hypnotized and start a whole new phenomenon Yay. Okay. Do you want to hear something that's like just not even any better? It's just worse? Yeah. Okay, good. Also, thank you to the three people who recommended that. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you for my nightmares. Yes. So. So. This topic was suggested in an email from Alina. 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 Hello. Hi. It's the Lake Bodum murders Mm. in Finland. Neat. So, this takes place on Saturday, June 4th, which is my birthday, Hmm. 1960, outside the city of Espoo, Finland. Oh, yeah. I've been there. Yeah? No. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I knew you hadn't, but I just wanted to go with it anyway. I could have really thrown that around if I wanted to, but I I chose not to. You just immediately were like... I was like, I regret this. You're like, the listeners are yelling, no, (laughs) turn it around. Everyone's like, we know you too well at this point. You haven't been there. (laughs) If it's not Canada, you haven't been. You ha- have you even been to Canada? No. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> okay. Four Finnish teenagers decide to go camping along the shore of a lake known as Lake Bodum, which is a rural area near Helsinki, Finland. So here are the four teenagers that went camping. There was 15-year-old Myla Ermeli Bjorklund and 15-year-old Anya Tulikimaki. Oh my god, I don't know how to pronounce her name. Sorry. Tulikimaki. Too licky maki. Sounds Hawaiian. It does, doesn't it? Uh, so Anya. And <laughs> that's her name. And then their boyfriends, 
uh, Seppo Ontario Boisman and Niels Wilhelm Gustafson, both 18. So these two 15-year-old girls, their two 18-year-old boyfriends all went camping at the lake. Hmm. I'm going to not touch the fact that they're 18 and dating minors. I mean, I think the rules are probably different in other countries okay. in the 1960s. Oh, yes. I forgot about the 1960s. I'm just going to throw that up. Did there. it happen to be, oh, it was June 4th, you said? Mm-hmm. Hmm. So that was just about over a year before this abduction. I actually, when you said 1961, I was like, ah. Yep. All right. So weird things were happening everywhere. The 1960s, if you guys remember, they were a weird time. We were all there. I mean, I was. In spirit. So these four teenagers, they mm-hmm. go camping. Mm-hmm. So around 6 a.m. the following morning, um, so it was Saturday night that they went camping. Sunday morning at 6 a.m., a few boys were out bird watching with binoculars, hmm. just like your story love a good binocular listen <laughs> <laughs> i don't know you know there's nothing like a good binocular there's nothing like a good prop set up with a binocular yeah to get a story going it's like why would you even go anywhere without apparently one? binoculars were like the trend of the 60s i mean clearly for everyone to just be carrying them around i mean i know because i was there but yeah <laughs> Binoculars were the trendiest. I mean, you're camping, you're driving, you got bananas and pajamas. You, <laughs> <laughs> you know, binoculars are important everywhere. You got bananas and pajamas, bananas and pajamas. It's all involved. It's all just quite a quite a decade. Probably everyone. Oh, you've was, got pleather. There was a oh, shiny pleather for sure. Everyone was probably on drugs. I don't really know how to explain it otherwise. Anyway. So there were some boys. They were out bird watching, and they noticed a collapsed tent near the lake. Later, around 11 a.m., uh, a local carpenter named Risto Siren discovered uh, the collapsed tent on a walk, and he found the bodies of Myla, Anya, and Seppo, who had all been stabbed and bludgeoned to death. Niels Gustafson was found as well. He was unconscious but alive. He had sustained a concussion and fractures to his jaw and face as Shit. well as a deep knife wound to the forehead. Fuck! Yeah. A deep? Deep knife wound to the Doesn't forehead. Doesn't that mean he's just hitting your brain? Yeah, just like straight in the head. Shit. You know, speaking of Deirdre. <laughs> speaking of wounds to the forehead, let's talk about Deirdre. Well, I do remember a time her brothers were batshit crazy when we oh, were little. Oh, no. And I remember, uh, it's a it's a famous story in in the Deirdre the Deirdre household. Oh, one of her brothers, who Cece's now married to, by the way, mm. threw scissors at the younger brother, and they got stuck in his forehead. I don't like that. <laughs> and he's just running around, and then to what? The, the the brother who is now Cece's husband, who threw the scissors, was like, "Don't tell mom! Don't tell mom!" <laughs> It's like a fucking cat in a hat, but like yes. nightmare version. I don't know if I was supposed to announce that. He's running around like a th- thing one, thing two with scissors in his forehead. Everyone knows about it now. Whoops. Anyway. Police determined that sometime between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. during their camping trip, someone approached their tent while they were sleeping and began to attack them from the outside of the tent with a knife and a blunt object, which they believed to either be a large rock or a pipe. Fuck. Um, so the person attacked from the outside, outside. with a knife, like, instead of... That's kind of even scarier, I think, because, like, you don't know where it's coming from. Like, yeah. there's just... Like, he didn't even care to see you get hurt. Like, he just yeah. wanted to hurt something and didn't even want to look at it. There's photos of the tent, and it just has giant slashes, like, out of a fucking Shit. slasher movie. Like, the tent is just sliced open. It's really... This is why when I go camping, I often don't want to spend the night, because I'm like... You want to know something? No, what? This is why I don't fucking go camping oh but i love camping i do too until it's six o'clock and the sun goes down and remember that time i went camping and i got a uti this is why i don't go camping look that was the last time i went camping i don't need to go again don't do it because you know what i'll get another uti you'll get a uti and there will people there are people with large pipes oh okay and they will hurt you (sighs) what else will happen to me you might go fishing but you'll also probably get killed so (laughs) i don't know mercury poisoning obviously i mean Endless ways to die. So Gustafson's girlfriend, okay, Myla, mm-hmm. um, she was found on top of the tent, undressed from the waist down. She had suffered the most injuries out of everyone. She had been stabbed multiple times after her death. No. 
um, while the other two teenagers had been killed with like less brutality. So she was stabbed a lot after she had died. And then Niels, who was her boyfriend, was also found lying on top of the tent. So he was the one who had sustained like the head wound but wasn't quite dead. So Niels was transported to a Red Cross station for treatment, and when he regained consciousness, they questioned him, and he claimed he remembered nothing at all from the attack but a black face with bright red eyes coming (gasps) for them. Oh, no. This has turned from true crime to paranormal. It's so creepy. That's all he remembered. He said it was, like, just a black form with, like, bright red eyes, and that's all he remembered. Well, that provides no leads to the police. That's fucking terrifying. Um, so this is where the police fucked up. They did not seal the site. They didn't record the details of the scene. Um, they almost immediately allowed a large number of police and other people to trample over the scene. Uh, they didn't collect evidence. They didn't record. So what did they do? What did they do? I mean, they took some notes, but they just let everybody kind of come in. So they didn't collect samples or things like that. Uh, they even, they called in soldiers to look for, uh, some missing like items and things but they tampered the whole crime scene basically that way um when they did examine the belongings they noticed that the killer had taken a series of items from the victims he took the keys to their motorcycles but he left the motorcycles Hmm. so the keys were gone but the motorcycles were still there um he took their wallets he took several of their clothing items But some of them, including Niels, the one who survived his shoes, but they were found half a mile from the crime scene, just kind of like hidden under leaves. Weird. And then the murder weapons also were nowhere to be found. Even when they had soldiers come like look through the lake, they couldn't find anything. They've never been found since then. Um, So at this point, I mean, this is like very small town Finland in the 60s. Like this is not a thing that happened Right. You know, um, even nowadays. So it was like really fucking horrifying. And police had several suspects that they questioned. So let's discuss. Let's discuss. Let's discuss. We it. should have a podcast where we just discuss let's things. Let's discuss. Like discuss it out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. Let's just discuss it out. Let's discuss it. What does discuss a little discuss? It's like a little discussing, a little cussing, a little discussing. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> god damn it okay so the first guy they questioned was named pauli luoma he had run away recently from a nearby work department close to the date of the murders so police tracked him down and questioned him but he had a solid alibi and was dismissed the next person they questioned was a guy named penty soy soy neenan uh he was a maintenance man who was convicted of several violent crimes in the 60s um, so that was after the murder. Right. In the decade after he had been convicted of several violent crimes. And at age 24, he was in jail and he confessed that he had committed the Lake Bodom murders while oh. he was in prison. And when police checked out his story, it turns out he had been 15 at the time of the murders and he actually lived nearby the lake. Oh my. So police interrogated him, but his confession wasn't given much weight because he was a known psychopath who liked to mess with people. Ah, shit. And so they were like, honestly, he could just be fucking with us for the sake of fucking with us. Mm -hmm. Um, And then in 1969, Soininen hanged himself at a prisoner transport station on the anniversary of the night of the killings. Oh, shit. Eerie. Creepy. So that's the end of that guy. The next guy was named Valdemar Gilstrom, a.k.a. Kiosk Man. Oh, yeah. You know. My job one day, I'm sure. (laughs) It's like. Working at a kiosk. (laughs) It's just, it's like that that friendly local kiosk man that we all know. (laughs) Many locals immediately suspected him because he ran a nearby kiosk, if you couldn't have guessed that. What? He did? I know. Weird. You thought he ran a butcher shop. You're not wrong. (laughs) A butcher kiosk. Butcher man. Okay. A meat kiosk. We'll stop. Okay. He ran... (laughs) (laughs) He ran a nearby kiosk and he hated campers. Ooh. He would sometimes throw rocks at passing children. Well, that if that's not me when I'm older, I don't know what is. <laughs> if that's not a classic kiosk man. A classic all, kiosk man. I don't know what is. Oh, M the kiosk man. That sounds like <laughs> a fucking newspaper Sunday cartoon. I know. M the kiosk man. <laughs> okay, so 
this guy fucking hated campers and everyone knew it. He hated children. Uh, also, what a specific thing to hate <laughs> when you don't even work outside. You work at a kiosk. I mean, a kiosk sort of outside, right? Like you have like a little. I think like a mall kiosk. Oh, no. I'm thinking like a like a train station kiosk or something. Oh. But we're so, saying kiosk a lot and now it doesn't even sound like a name. You like know, a word when you anymore. say that, I used to do that the word salami over and over until salami. it just sounded like. Syllables. I used to do that with the word obey. Oh, that's creepy. Obey, so obey, you were just obey. a small child yelling obey. Like I think I heard it from some demon. comedian at some point. And they were like, if you say obey enough times, it doesn't sound like a word anymore. And then I tried it and I was like, oh, no. You sound like a demon child. Obey, 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 obey. Fucking Furby. Yeah. All right. What were we talking about? Kiosks? I think so. Let's keep talking about those. Okay. All right. So he was just kind of like an asshole. And then during a drunken conversation with a neighbor... He confessed to the murders Uh-oh. soon before his death. He said, I killed them. Oh, that's pretty, pretty on the nose. It's like slightly incriminating. <laughs> um, so police talked to his wife and she claimed he had been asleep at home with her at the time of the killing. So police stopped investigating him. But he had also been f- seen filling a well in the front of his yard only days after the murders. And a lot of neighbors and even his relatives insisted that he had hidden the murder weapons in the filled in well Ooh! police never police searched his property though and they never found any physical evidence to convict him but uh, to this day he's still suspicious in many people's eyes in 1969 uh gilstrom drowned himself in lake bodum oh and years later his wife was on her deathbed and recanted the alibi Hmm. she gave saying he had threatened to kill her if she told police that he hadn't been at home that night oh so police were apparently also skeptical of his confessions or his alleged confessions because they considered him quote disturbed i mean yeah, this is just a thought dab for people are probably also disturbed i don't I'd know. imagine so anyway so that's but the, again this is the second person who's admitted to or confessed to the murder so it's like what the fuck why does everyone want their name on this murder listen i don't know but you're going to, I do know something. I'm ready. You're going to like I want to know it too. You're going to like this next guy's name. Tell me. First name Hans. Last name Assman. <gasps> you're not wrong. That's a name I love. <laughs> I'm not even making it up. Assman. Okay. So Tell me he did it. It's spelled ass man with two N's. So like Asman. Ah. It's ass man. Ass man. Literally every article was like, can we talk about his name for a second? Okay. <laughs> Like, every single one written in English was like, but let's focus on that for one minute. <laughs> then we can talk about him as a suspect. So his name is Hans Assman. I'm not even kidding. So this guy lived a few kilometers from Lake Bodum. Most of the public suspicion has been focused on him over the years. He was a former KGB spy and former Nazi. Oh, shit. Yeah. Uh, the day after the murder... Ass man. I can't even take it seriously. It's so absurd. It's wonderful. Hans. It's like if his last name was like fuckhead. <laughs> Someday you gotta ask my dad about his Paul Shithead joke. That's his favorite joke. He knows someone named Paul Shithead? Listen, just ask him about it. Okay. He will tell you the story so good. Maybe I should introduce myself first. Hi, I'm M. Tell me about Shithead. Paul Shithead. Favorite story. Okay, so, beep, boop, bop. Hans came into the Helsinki Surgical Hospital, his clothes covered in red stains and his fingernails filled with black dirt. Staff said he was acting nervous and aggressive and even pretended to be unconscious for a while. Police didn't investigate him any further because they said he had a solid alibi. Uh, But this was against the doctor's insistence that the stains on his clothes were blood. And the police refused to take the clothes as samples to investigate. What kind of fucking Finland police are there where they're like, nah, let's not take the clothes. They're like, it, let's just let them trample all over the crime scene. I mean, he might be painting a house red. Let's Who take knows? a note and then throw it away. Let's just let ass man go. Yeah. Also, why is he pretending to sleep? That's some creepy shit. He was pretending to be unconscious, apparently. Like, for show? Like. Just, like, in the hospital. Like, just... They said he was, like, aggressive and crazy and then just pretended to be unconscious. And they just... Okay. And they were like, something's wrong with him. And they're like, oh, well, it's not... He's not the guy. Uh, okay. It's not. He's covered in blood, but it's fine. <laughs> um. So, 
Later, he also raised suspicion, raised some red flags. Uh, he There was a news report. Remember those kids I said who had those uh, lovely binoculars who were yeah. bird watching? So they had seen the tent, but they had also reported that same day that they had seen a blonde man walking from the tent away. Hmm. So there was a news report where they talked about these kids who had seen this blonde guy, and they described him as having long blonde hair. So right after that news report came out, Hans cut his long blonde hair short. Oh, shit. And everyone was like, wait, what the fuck? Um, and then later, Niels Gustafsson, the one who survived, the guy who survived, was put under hip, uh, hypnosis, and he described the same long blonde hair. Oh, wow. And so the guy had cut the, his hair off. <clears throat> so, Dr. Jorma Paolo, one of the first doctors to examine Aspen... <laughs> Went on to write three books about his connection to the murders. Um, and then former detective Mati Paloaro connected him to five other homicides that he believed he might have committed. So five other unsolved homicides. Uh, some people think that his that Hans's political connections were the reason he wasn't investigated further. So he had all these like connections to, I mean, obviously Nazi, KGB, etc. Yeah. And so some people thought maybe those were the reason he somehow got out of... Right. Being investigated. So, this guy, Hans Assman, was considered the public's main suspect for about 44 years until... Two th- 44 years. So, he was like Christ. the main fucking suspect. In 2004, investigators decided to reopen the case due to advanced technology that had apparently uncovered new blood evidence on a pair of shoes and new testimony from a woman who claimed to have been camping nearby that night. Ooh. So the new DNA analysis led to the arrest of a new suspect. Named? Lone survivor Niels Gustafsson. Ooh, he did it to them and then to himself? Dun, dun, dun. That makes sense, I guess, if his girlfriend was the one that was most brutally disturbed. So the new... So at this point, uh, Gustafson had moved on. He was living a somewhat normal life. He had a family. He was a retired school bus driver. Um, and according to the prosecution who took him to trial, they believed Gustafson got drunk, killed his three friends due to a combination of jealousy and teenage hormones. Uh, if we've had him once, we've had him a million times. <laughs> Millions of those hormones just... I mean, they're the reason I killed all my friends. It's like homicidal rage. I know. I know. I mean, it's why we listen to emo Deirdre music. only survived because she sends me sugar bush autographs. <laughs> Listen up close, friends. Um, So they speculated that he used a blunt object to then give himself a concussion. A woman claiming that she had been camping nearby that same night said that Gustafson and the other guy visited her campsite that night, were drunk and aggressive, but there were no... There was no evidence to corroborate her story, and her story came out right as a documentary was being filmed about it. So it was the first time in 45 years that anyone had heard of this and it happened to be through a document right uh so they used dna analysis to prove that all three murder victims blood was on the pair of shoes that they had found like half a mile away that belonged mm. to niels gustafson but his blood was not on the shoes and they basically the prosecution argued that this meant gustafson had been stabbed at a different time than the other three, meaning he had inflicted it upon himself after he had gotten rid of his shoes. Mm. That was their argument. Um, Gustafson was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, but his sentence only lasted a year and then was immediately overturned. He was released. Finland paid him 44,900 euro for the mental suffering caused by the long remand time. Uh, he's no longer considered a suspect. Why? Because they just didn't have the evidence. They said, like, oh, his blood wasn't on the shoes, but that doesn't... Right, I guess someone could have killed all of them, taken his shoes, and then it killed him. It just wasn't and, yeah. proof to be like, he definitely did it. And it was one of those things where they were like, oh, yeah, we solved the case finally. And then a year later, he was like, he appealed, and they were like, I guess we really don't have any reason <laughs> to keep you... Also, how old was he at that point? Like, in his 50s or 60s? Like, um, I don't know. It was 44 years later, so... 
First of all, that also would have taken a lot of heart to break your own fucking jaw and stab yourself in the brain. Oh, yeah. And he was unconscious. Like, he was out. And then people argued, like, how would he have hidden the murder weapons if yeah, he was if unconscious? if he stabbed himself in the brain. And then the knife and the blunt object were never found even when they... Can you imagine if you already went through all of... Like, you're a teenager. Your girlfriend gets brutally murdered. Mm-hmm. All of your friends are dead. You barely make it out alive. And you're like, I can't believe I went through that. And then after spending like 40 something years trying to get past that Be normal, then they're like, oh, you did it. And you're going to go to jail for the rest of your life. Why don't you go to jail? <laughs> yeah, it's it's fucking terrifying. And I mean, who knows? But at the same time, think about all the other people who seemed like the exact person who would have done it. It's like mm-hmm. it's easy to like right. assume one of, you know, that he did it if you prove it the right way. But then one of their arguments, too, was that his blood was found around the tent and they were like well yeah but he was also stabbed in the head like of course it's right. fucking blood you know so it was just very they had very flimsy evidence and like even once he appealed they were like yeah we did not have enough evidence to prove that you did it so he was rewarded forty five thousand euro for you know that whole thing and since then no suspects have been brought to trial the case remains unsolved however this is kind of creepy There is a photograph that you can see online that was taken at one of the victim's funerals, and it shows an unidentified man who looks exactly like the composite sketch released by police that was drawn when Niels Gustafson was under hypnosis. He, like, he, like, he explained the face, and they drew it, and if you look at the photo... It's He's in there. The face, and nobody still knows who that is, and it's like all family and friends, and then this guy oh, weird. at the funeral. Ugh. I know, and it looks just like. And I was like, "What do you mean he looks just like a drawing?" But like, it's really uncanny. Wow. And he's still un- unidentified. So that's <laughs> one other weird element that nobody has been able to figure out. Um. So this is arguably Finland's most famous unsolved murder. Obviously. Um, It's had tremendous cultural impact, both in Finland and globally. So there's a pretty famous band, I don't know if you know them, from nearby Espoo, Finland, called Children of Bodom. Nope. So they are pretty well known. They took their name from the case. Um, Apparently the legend goes, or the story goes, that they were looking through the phone book and trying to come up with a cool name, and they saw like lake bodum and they were like Mm -hmm. oh yeah (laughs) we're gonna name ourselves after that nice crime or whatever nice um so they're uh (laughs) you know your average finnish melodic death metal band oh well that's all i've ever wanted i mean i know there's a lot of bands in that genre i mean i have a specific music preference right and if you look close enough it really is all just finished death metal yeah yeah i plan on dancing with allison to finish death metal at our wedding one day. Oh, that's day. precious. She she actually asked for it. That's really heartwarming. It just, I mean, we're meant to be. I mean, why not name it after a brutal murder in Finland? Mm-hmm. I think my dad and I might dance to that for the father-daughter dance. Ooh. I know. Sweet. Fun. So, anyway, that's that's the story of the Lake Bodum murders. Thank you, Alina, for sending that in. Thank you, Alina. Also, Alina, that's kind of weird. That you know so much and that you wanted us to talk about it. Alina, like, do you, like, listen to death metal? What? It is interesting that we do have listeners. I mean, Grant, this is what we literally ask them to do. But people think of, like, oh, what's the most fucked up thing I know? Oh, Christine and M, you guys should go spend your entire (laughs) night researching this whole thing and really just ruining your own mental energy. And then report it for all of us. You're right in that, like, we literally beg people to do that. Yeah, so, like, I can't be mad, but also it's like... I, I don't want to thank you entirely because because of you, I am now having nightmares that Allison has to deal with all the time and then I get yelled at in the morning. I mean, there's a little bit of resentment building towards you all. At one point, Allison was like, I think you should go to a therapist because apparently <laughs> oh, all, no. all the time now, like regularly, I have horrible dreams because of all the shit I'm reading before I go to bed. And now I just like flounder in bed. Apparently, I just like I like jabber in the face with my elbows she's like i think you need to like, like talk to someone about your dreams i i'm like probably i mean she's not wrong <laughs> probably i have a uh like i'm using talk space which is one of our sponsors by the way guys if you 
are interested, Talkspace.com slash drink. Whoever your representative is, I'm so sorry for what they probably have to listen to. Like, <laughs> She's listen, wonderful. I have a true crime podcast and I, I talk about murder and... This poor lady. She's like, <laughs> so she, I, she's great. Like, it's a really great service. And I, it's great because you can talk to them whenever you need to and then they'll get back to you. So I'll like message her occasionally and I like, I'm always messaging her about the podcast and I'm like, I'm so stressed out. Like I, I don't know how to manage my time, blah, 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 blah. And then she's like, so I know a lot about M. Let's talk about your fiance. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. It's like, but that's not important. No, no, no. I'm like, no, no, no. Let's talk about the podcast. Did you tell her the name of no, the podcast? I don't Probably think. for the best. Yeah, I probably won't. Because she'll probably listen to it and be like, oh, this is the fucking... This is the girl that's talking to me. She's beyond help. Also, probably like if you told her, oh, yeah, I have a podcast called and That's Why We Drink. Oh, she's going to figure out like, where my problems are. You guys, thanks for listening. We love you. And thanks for being our patrons and being patient with us as we try to give you all the gifts we can give you. Also, we have a Facebook Live video coming out that's soon. That's right. Correct? Yes. On the 14th? Sunday, the 14th at 3 p.m. Yay. Pacific time. Pacific. So if you haven't joined, if you're a patron and you haven't joined the ATWWD patron only Facebook group, then go join that so you can be part of the Facebook Live. Yes. Next Sunday. Also, uh, if you wanted to follow us anywhere in the world. And you do. On social media. You can follow our personal pages at X Teen Schiefer and The M Schultz. Is that true? Wow, wow, wow. How do you do that noise? <laughs> wow, 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 wow. I don't that, know. That like air horn? Oh, like the John wow, Cena wow, wow. sound? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. And uh, <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> you could also follow uh, Geo on Instagram <laughs> at geo underscore takes underscore LA. That's right. It's a real babe. He's a babe. Um, you can follow our so podcast. Now that, we're off, uh, now that we're off the individual. Yes, yes. <laughs> You can also follow my mother anywhere at Linda Freeze. <laughs> so listen, Renata wants to be friend. Renata accepts all the friend requests. And I'm like, stop Aww. accepting random people. She's like, no, they're really friendly. And she's I'm like, like, look, with my true crime background, I can handle anything. Yeah. She's like, don't worry. I have a knife on me. Oh, my God. Go on. So our podcast, <laughs> you can find right. us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at ATWWD podcast. You can also follow us um where else let's see we have a website yes we, we do. do we do and we that's do. why we drink.com it's been a while guys my spiel is a little rusty i mean this is really the only thing i depend on you for here we have a website and that's why we drink.com we also have a store we can buy our fun merch right. and that's why we drink at dot big cartel.com correct and then you can also help us at patreon with atwwd podcast we have an email, and that's why we drink at gmail.com, where you can send in your listeners' episodes. We put out... Listener stories. God damn it. Let me just do it again. Guys, sometimes I give them, like, a little, like, chance to talk. <laughs> Shut up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Listener stories, and we put out listeners' episodes at the first of every month. <laughs> just kidding. I'm yeah. just going to stop trying You're now. You're the only one who knows how to do it. Guys, I'm usually really good at this. I know you know that because you listened to the, all the episodes before this one. It's just we've been MIA for, like, two weeks now. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening to us. Seriously, we thank have you. we have um, a, a potential perfect clink. Oh right, we tried to practice this. Let's see what happens. All right, ready? Wait, is it? It's got to be uh, this one? relatively filled. Yeah, wait, wait, no, because I hit the, the table. Filled. That's all. Hit it like this. No, nope. nope. oh. it's got to be on hard ground. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Try this one. God damn it! We thought we'd be so good at this. Ready? That was pretty perfect. Ah, high five. All right. Now we know how to do that. We can't mess up anymore. All right. So now we need to On leave. On the 50th episode, we will nail it. Uh, okay. We need to leave this wine glass exactly full like that. Yep. <laughs> Forever. It's going to have fruit flies in it and mold. Goodbye. And that's why we drink. And that's why we drink. Goodbye.